Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. It is not a leap year, so do not worry. Tomorrow is not going to still be February. We get, we're making it to March. We're coming up on a full year in this season. And you know, it, it's been a season with some struggles, but it's also been a season with a lot of joy. Uh, we've had numerous births in our church family and we do have a lot to celebrate. Uh, but if there is anybody out there that happens to have a February 29th birthday that doesn't get to celebrate this year, happy birthday. Sorry you don't get to celebrate tomorrow, but do something really, really fun today and celebrate and have a good time because it is important in this season for us to find things to celebrate and find joy. And now let us join together in worship. Please join me in our call to worship. Return to the Lord your God, for God is gracious. Confess to the Lord your God, for God is merciful. Repent to the Lord your God, for God is slow to anger. Praise the Lord your God, for God abounds in steadfast love. Let us worship the Lord together.
People of God, as we come to worship our holy God, we always, as we stand in front of Him, we look at ourselves. All of us are sinners. And as we follow our Master all the way to the cross, many times we fell into temptations and we sin. But thanks be to God, that as we come to him with prayer of confession, God promised that he will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all iniquities. So people of God, please join me as we come to God the Father with prayer of confession. O God, you have made us your covenant people, marked us as your own and it charged us for life of service. Forgive us when we live as if success were the worthiest aim or independence the highest virtue. Call us once more to take up our crosses and show us how to follow you. Wash us in your mercy and lead us to live everlasting. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we praise the Lord for his promise to us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful, he is just, he is merciful, he forgives our sins and cleanses us from all iniquities. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, we are forgiven. Amen.
Hi, I'm Warren Johnson. I'm one of your new deacons. I've been in this church for 21 years now, and I've enjoyed being in the chancel choir during that time, and also the Carpenters Fellowship. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Gracious God, our way in the wilderness, guide us by your word and minister to us through your Holy Spirit so that we may be reformed, restored, and renewed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Our scripture lesson today is Psalm 133 and 1 Peter 3, verses eight and nine. Hear the word of the Lord. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. From there, the Lord ordained his blessing, life evermore.
from 1 Peter. Finally, all of you have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart, and an humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It is for this that you were called, that you might inherit a blessing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When uh, former President Donald Trump gave his last State of the Union address and he was walking into the chamber and he went up to the lectern and he refused to uh, shake the hand of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Then he gave the address and as he was walking away, uh, Nancy Pelosi ripped up his speech and this all happened on national television. I thought to myself, Shame on both of them for doing that. But it was also indicative of the polarization, I think, of our society. And a lot of people have been talking about that, how polarized everybody seems to be. And uh, so as a pastor, of course, I thought about how can we minister to a polarized society like that? And if we are to minister to that kind of a society, then we as a church must be in unity. So today, our focus is not so much on the society as much as it will be on the church. And I uh, am looking at Psalm 133 as our guide. I chose Psalm 133 in this series on the psalm because it gives us an important key to the unity in the body of Christ. In Psalm 133, it starts right out, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. The psalmist says that unity is both good and pleasant. And that's a good thing, because sometimes we can, uh, some things can be good for us and yet not pleasant. I think about going to the dentist, right? It's good to have your teeth uh, fixed or cleaned or whatever, Uh, but it's not a pleasant experience. And I'm not trying to get down on dentists. Uh, I love my dentist. As a matter of fact, we're very good friends. And just a couple of years ago, I officiated his wedding. But the fact is that sometimes when we go to the dentist, it's just not a pleasant experience. And some things can be pleasant for us, but not good. I enjoy working on my truck. I like to get out four-wheeling, get out in the backcountry, do some overlanding, you know, things like that. And yet, if I did that pleasant experience all the time and didn't get any work done, it wouldn't be good for me. But unity in the church, according to the psalmist, is both pleasant and good. Now, obviously, I think we can all agree that no one wants to be a part of a church that's bickering or gossiping or, you know, uh, where conflict dominates, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, That wouldn't be an enjoyable place to be, of course. And in 30 years of studying the church, and I probably worked with almost 50 churches, when I ask them to describe themselves, there's a common thing I see almost to the word for every church when they talk about themselves. They will, somewhere along the line, say something like this. They'll say, we are a friendly church. Or they'll say, we are a friendly congregation. I have never in the entire time ever heard somebody say this about their church, that we are a church that is the meanest, cantankerous, bad-tempered, you know, argumentative, uncooperative bunch of people uh, that ever got together. No, nobody ever says that to me about their church, right? I mean, we wouldn't, send, we wouldn't put that on a postcard and send it around. Yeah, we stink, so come and see us. You know? uh, we wouldn't do that kind of thing. No, we don't say that. And yet, When we look at the New Testament, most of the epistles or letters of the New Testament were written to the church because they were the meanest, cantankerous, bad-tempered, argumentative, and uh, uncooperative bunch of people that ever followed the Lord. So whether we look at uh, 1 and 2 Timothy or Titus or we, you know, Look at uh, Paul's uh, letter to the Ephesians. We see that churches have had problems with their unity in getting all together. And 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 9 is uh, no different. There's about six chapters in uh, 1 Peter. 
And so we come to uh, the, about the middle uh, of his letter, and uh, he's gone on in teaching and so forth, and then he stops and says, to sum up all that I've taught you now through the first couple of chapters, to sum it all up, all of you be harmonious. That's what he says. He tells us to be harmonious. They were having a problem with that. He says, this is the kind of harmony I want, to be sympathetic and brotherly and kind-hearted and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. So it's pretty important. And I think the psalmist in 133 gives us a way to uh, live out that summation of what Peter was saying, that harmony. And he gives us an example. And the example is about the anointing of Aaron. Now you'll remember in the Old Testament that Aaron was the brother of Moses and that it was his anointing and installation as a priest that began the priestly line that we see throughout the Old Testament. And part of the installation process was the anointing of oil. And uh, they would take a, a, a thick, rich, very fragrant oil and pour it over Aaron's head. And so as the psalmist describes it, he says, uh, uh, it, it's like this, this unity is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the hair and, and the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his, of his priestly robe. That's the idea uh, that he places before us. You know, when I was thinking about that event with, uh, with Aaron and his installation and the oil that was involved, it reminded me of, uh, of Matthew 26, verses 6 through 13. What happens in that uh, area of Scripture is that Jesus is over at Simeon's house, or um, Simon's house, and uh, you might remember that Simon was a leper whom Jesus had healed, and he's having dinner with him, and his disciples are there, and maybe uh, Martha and Mary were there too, and they're just in the middle of their meal. Jesus is reclining at the table. And then this woman comes in, and Matthew doesn't identify her, but she comes in. Some, some experts believe that it was Mary Magdalene, but we don't, we don't know for sure. But she comes in, in the middle of the meal. We don't even know if she was actually invited to the dinner. And she has a vial this uh, this vial of uh, oil, uh, expensive alabaster vial, and she breaks it open and dumps it on top of Jesus' head. And here he is sitting at the table. Everyone's surprised. And this oil is thick and it's rich and the fragrance just fills the, the house, uh, you know, and flows down his hair and into his beard and onto his tunic. It it's surprising. It's extravagant. You know, it's a, it's an abundant, costly gift. As a matter of fact, it alarmed the disciples, and they immediately got after this woman and said, "You know, you 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 could have used that in some other way. What are you doing? You're disrupting everything." And yet Jesus stops them and says, "Wait a minute. <laughs> this was a blessing that she gave me. She is anointing me for my burial, and not too long after that meal." Jesus was on his way to his crucifixion, and I'm sure that this fragrant oil still lingered on him up to the cross. When I think about these examples, the one that the psalmist gave and where Matthew recorded this event in, uh, in his book about Jesus being anointed, I, I see some commonality in there, and it reminds me of something. When we think about the description of oil, we see that the oil is costly. We realize that it's fragrant, it's precious, it's abundant, it's always in an extravagant way. It flows, it drenches. Listen to those kinds of things. It's a gift poured out. What does that remind us of? Well, it reminds me of God's grace. God's grace is that way. God's grace was costly. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave something up. It was costly. 
It is fragrant. How many times does Paul talk about us in being in the world as a, as a fragrance of our Lord? It was precious. It was abundant. And it was an extravagant gift. It flows and it drenches us. It's a gift poured out. Yes, it truly is a description, a wonderful description of God's grace. The psalmist is saying that the only way that we can find unity in the church is through this blessing. This idea of being drenched and having it flow through us, this gift poured out to us of God's abundant and extravagant gift of grace. The only time we will not return evil for evil or insult for insult to our brothers and sisters in Christ It's when we've opened our hearts to this grace and we let it anoint us. His abundance and extravagance, his costly gift, and we let him pour it all over us and drench us with his love. When we let God anoint us with his gift, we can be a blessing to each other in the church. And you know, in Hebrews, Paul tells us that we are all a royal priesthood. And just like Aaron, just like the example that the psalmist gave in 133, we have been blessed with this oil of Christ poured out abundantly. It's coming down our hair and into our beards and onto our collar, marking us for something very, very special. We have all been called for a very special purpose, a purpose of unity. Together, we are the woman who comes into Simon's house and unexpectedly anoints Jesus. I'm glad that they don't know who that woman is because I think it gives us an opportunity to put our own name there. We, we, we can all be that woman who comes in and is willing with our congregation and our own people to crack that vial open and pour out God's grace and blessing to them, to others around us. We can all receive that. We must be moved to open our hearts to God's grace. So many times there are uh, the little issues that come up in churches that cause discord or problems. It's, now, you know, sure, there have been churches that have had uh, issues over doctrinal challenges and things like that. There's no doubt about that. But I think the majority of times, it's really a discussion a- about personalities and drama and gossip and all kinds of things like that that lets, that tears apart a church and creates discord and disunity. Our church is coming into a very, very important time. We're searching for a pastor. We're just beginning that process. That's a, can be a long process, maybe a year, maybe more. Who knows what, where the Holy Spirit will lead. But we know that when we go through that process, here's an opportunity for us to exercise God's grace to one another and keep unity in that process. Sometimes it's the, you know, the little things, as I said, that, that can cause the biggest problem. I, I, I'll be honest with you, and I, I'm probably chief among the sinners about wearing our, our masks. I, I can't stand to wear a mask. When I go to the store, you know, and I'm wearing a mask, I, I don't like anything over my face. It messes up my beard, you know. Uh, and it, I, I just hang on to the point where I can get back to my truck, and I rip my mask off and take a deep breath. I, I don't like it. And yet... I still wear it and I still follow the guidelines in our church when we come together because it's an act of grace. And I'm reminded of the wonderful grace that God gave to me and I want to be that same blessing to others. And so to make everybody feel safe and to follow the the wonderful leadership of our elders, I wear my mask. That's going to create unity. To be kind-hearted and humble in spirit that's what I need. I, I, I pray the Holy Spirit sends the Holy, you know, comes upon our church so that we can all, you know, be that kind heartedness and, and humble enough to do the things that we need to do that will bring unity and keep the unity in our 
in our congregation so that we can dwell together in unity and keep our church as a very good and pleasant place. So may this be our prayer in the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit comes upon us, that we may be a blessing to each other, called for the very purpose of unity. And I go back to that Psalm 133, where it all begins, and he says, Behold how good and pleasant. Behold, meaning look, look here, look at this, look how how good and pleasant it is to see this unity of the body. And so it is that if we are unified in all that we do, this polarized society that we live in will behold and see, see how good and pleasant it is when people dwell in unity. Amen. Lent season remind us of God's love. When God loved us and gave us himself. And as we come to worship a holy God, we come also with our offerings. We bring ourselves to him and our offerings in our hands. Please join me as we come to God with our offerings. Please join me with this prayer. God of the wilderness, we give these offerings in gratitude, rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give these offerings in faith, trusting that you will provide for our needs. We give these offerings in hope, knowing you can use them to spread your love in this world. And with these offerings, we give ourselves. May we live with generous hearts, with open hands. Amen. so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Savior friend, and I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. As we come to God the Father with our prayers and requests, we are reminded that in these holy days, the Lent season, God is with us all the time. He was with us in the past, He's still the same. He walked with us every day, not only to the end of this Lent season, but until Christ comes back. Let us bring our requests and our prayers to the Lord. Please join me in prayer. Let us pray. Our great and heavenly Father, 
We come to you and we lift our eyes unto you. From where our help comes, our help comes from you. You are the maker of heaven and earth. We give all the praises to you that you've been faithful with us in the past and you're still the same. You will never sleep or slumber. You promise to keep us as you kept Israel in the wilderness. And you, O oh Lord, you are the same. You have been faithful with your people in the past and you're still the same with us today. And we know that tomorrow you also will be there for tomorrow. You've been our help in the past and you are the only hope for all of us in the ages to come. We thank you that the Lent season remind us of your love to us. You loved us. You gave us your only begotten Son. In Christ, we get to see you. We get to know you. We get to worship you. In Christ, our sins have been forgiven. And in Christ, we have the hope of eternity. Lord, we pray that these holy days will be the days when all of us, your people, will fix our eyes on Christ, following him to the cross and fixing our eyes on him and him alone. For Christ is the author of our faith and he is the finisher. Lord, you are our light and salvation. Whom shall we fear? You promise to be with your people. And although there are many temptations around us, but we fear none. For your rod and your staff comfort us. Lord, we thank you that with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit inside each one of us, we feel so close to you. So help us to be faithful waiting for the day when Christ will come back. Lord, we come to you as your people. And we have many needs among us. Needs in the church, people been suffering, going through temptation. They need help spiritually and physically. And thank you that you are here for all of us. We pray for our community. We pray for our nation. We pray for all of us to be faithful to you, knowing that you are the one who bought us by your own blood. We belong to you. We are yours. So help us to give everything back to you. For you are the one who came to us, became one like us. And on the cross, you transferred us from darkness to light. We come to you, O Lord, and we pray for the sick among us. We pray for the needy, physically and spiritually. We pray for those who grieve. And we pray for our nation and direction for the nation. We pray for our church and the search for a pastor. Help us to be assured that you are with us in the midst of your people. So we should not fear anything. We come to you and we pray, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus, our Good Shepherd, the one who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
glad you chose to join us in worship today. As this time together ends, may the Lord Jesus lead you in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. May Holy Spirit restore your soul so that you wait on the Heavenly Father. Have a great day. Go with God.